welcome to um, tonight's webinar, um, an imp implant planning, a guide from start to finish. I'm Dr. Kunal Shah, so I'll be presenting this evening. Um, just a few, a few kind of house rules to say. If you do have any questions during the during the webinar, please feel free to pop them in the in the chat, and I'll try and go through them either as I'm going through the slides or at the end. Uh, it's no trouble at all. And uh, thank you for taking your time out this evening um, um, to listen. And I have taken a different approach on this webinar. I've gone more clinical. Um, so there's a lot of clinical cases, but I hope they'll what they'll do is they'll help you understand the reasoning behind um, some of the decisions, the theory, and how we then apply them practically as well. So to give you a bit of background just on myself, I studied at the University of Birmingham um, and worked as a GDP for many years, uh, acquired a practice in 2016, which I have made fully digital. So it's an entire digital workflow setup. And that's relevant, especially for, for what we're going to speak about today. Previously, a clinical educator for dental hygienists and therapists from the University of Essex, and currently an FD trainer or Previously, I was an FTD trainer on London Deanery. I'm a KOL for several companies, um, Norris Medical, 3M, uh, Carestream, on predominantly the implant side and the digital dentistry side. Um, so I'll be able to go through that with you as we go through some of the cases today. So what are the aims and objectives for today? We're looking at talking about the benefits of CBCT, their place in a GDP's portfolio more specifically, understand what to achieve in implant planning and how to plan a single implant case, how to plan from a CBCT and their vital role in implant placement and understanding the full workflow for an implant case in general practice. And then an overview of implant planning via cl clinical cases. So first, first question is, what do we want to achieve? And this is imperative when planning any, any surgical cases, any implant cases, and it's prosthetically driven implant planning. That's one of the kind of golden rules or themes throughout the whole, the whole presentation. For prosthetically driven implant planning, what that effectively means is we plan where our prosthesis or our crown is going to be placed first, and then we work backwards to place the implant. So rather than placing the implant in wherever the most bone is and then placing the restorative after, it's the other way around. We, we aim to place where our rest restoration should be in line with everything else and then work backwards. And why is that important? That's important because if we're planning um, using PDIP, processing driven implant planning, it means that our cases are much more predictable, which means that we're much more precise in our, in our actual work. What that will then entail is that we have much better service, much better quality, and subsequently we'll have a much reduced, a lower risk or reduced risk. So on the litigation side, that's, that, that's much better. So what is the ideal workflow? So step one would be doing a 3D scan, a CBCT scan. That allows you to understand the bony aspects um, of, what you're, of what you're, the area you're working in. You then take a um, intraoral scan. So that allows, it's almost like a digital impression, but that allows you to get the soft tissue elements. You then merge them together. So you have your 3D scan and your intraoral scan meshed together so you can see the soft tissue on your image. You then place your implant on the scan. So you plan exactly where you want your prosthesis to be, where you want your implant to be placed, and you're doing this all on the scan, you can then make a surgical guide, um, which we will go into more detail later. You then do the restorative aspect, which is either conventional or via a digital scan, and then you place your restoration. So that is the ideal workflow in any given situation. However, what we have done is I've created an adapted workflow, predominantly because many practices may not have an intraoral scanner at hand. Um, in addition to this, they may not have a CBCT scanner at hand, um, so it may refer out, but this is more for realistic kind of workflow in, in, in an, any GDP environment. 
So what we tend to do here is you do the 3D scan. You may not have the intraoral scanner, which means you do then plan everything on the 3D scan, the placement of your crown, the placement of your implant, and then your restorative aspect is done conventionally. So with an impression coping, either an open or closed face tray, and then, and then you fit the crown, um, which, we'll into, which we'll detail much further on. So to understand implant planning, where we need to go back to the beginning. So where do we start from? What did we used to do historically? And previously we would take a periapical x-ray. So what that would mean is we'd, we'd find a metal ball. Usually it'd be five or seven millimeters in diameter. And we would then calibrate the ball. And then from that, we would then measure from our anatomical landmark um, or from the, from the ridge, from the bony ridge to our anatomical landmark. Now, this, is, this was good in terms it gave a really quick eyeball of whether it was possible to do an implant in that area, but the disadvantages are it's a 2D flat view. So for instance, on the PA that's on this slide, you can see it's a lower left six area, but you can't tell if there's any concavities, buccal or lingual. All you can see is there's, there's good bone. You can see the, um, the IDN and therefore just work kind of vertically, but it's, you're, you're unable to get all the information. So it's very good for a quick eyeball, but to, to plan more accurately, you do need a 3D scan. So what is a CBCT or the technical bits? It's a variation on the medical CT scan. Um, so this is an example of one of the, the scanners. In, well, that's the scanner in my practice. Um, and it's much smaller than a conventional medical CT. Um, radiation dose is quite low. Um, what's good about this is it's an open design. The reason it's important for it to have an open design is because you can then import or export your CBCT to other softwares for surgical guide planning. So that will come later in a clinical case, but it's just something to bear in mind from the outset. Um, it follows ALARP rules, which means um, as low as reasonably possible for radiation dose. And it's to be honest, it's essential for implant planning and placement. So how has it changed our implant planning? So I'll run through a case just to kind of give you an idea of how we plan and, and, and how we utilize our CBCT scans. So here's an example of a CBCT for an upper left two region. Now, the reason we take a 3D scan is to visualize our area of interest in the whole purpose of that is so we have a more effective diagnosis and therefore a more effective treatment plan and therefore able to minimize the risk. So if you remember from the start, we had our four points, PDIP and then precision and predictable outcomes. This is one of those aspects that helps you to achieve that. So our four areas to evaluate are our 3D render, which is your bottom left. You then go with the yellow mark, you go up to the arch you want to go to. So in this case, it's the, the maxilla the upper left two, which we then form the arch on your top, top left. You then go with the blue line to your area of interest, which is upper left two, which is your top right. And then your bottom right is your sectional slice, which is that specific area. Now, in some instances, I took a full scan on this case, but on hindsight and reflection, you, you may not need that. You could do half the map, to be fair. Um, for much bigger cases, I do take a full, and that's mainly because of planning. Um, so it's just something to, to note. Um, but this allows you to see all four aspects and therefore plan accordingly on it. So if we now take these in much further detail, your 3D render view is your, your left slide, and you can actually see a lot of information from that. And it's worth noting what to look for. Now, in this area, you can see there's some buccal bone resorption you can see the distance between the adjacent teeth. You can see how prominent the roots are as well. Um, and it gives you an idea. This is out of occlusion, but you can make it in, in occlusion as well. But there's a lot of information just obtained from the 3D render. Now your OPG on the other side is derived from the arch form. And it allows you to assess, in this case, where the sinus is. And also your, your uh, distance between adjacent teeth, you've got to bear in mind, we have to consider the biological width as well. 
Um, so there is a number of questions that you do always have to answer when you're looking at scans and you always have to start thinking in your mind when planning a case. And these are some of those questions. And they're all stimulated from the fact that you have a 3D scan. So what do we have to consider in more detail here? In this instance, we have to look at the aesthetic zone. Um, we are in the aesthetic zone. We are in the upper left two region. We have to consider the fact there may be gingival recession. We have to consider the cuff of gingivae as well and our emergence profile for restoration. With regards to the recession aspect, I won't um, dwell too much on flap designs as well because that's already been covered in a previous webinar. But that's something of consideration for sure in this aspect, um, especially to avoid any scarring, especially to avoid any recession. So you have to understand surgical principles as well. So that is something to consider, um, but I won't, won't dwell too much on that aspect. So how do we plan? We always plan the restoration prior to placing any implant, always. So prosthetically driven implant placement. And we look at our adjacent teeth. So we look at, if you look at the sectional slices, what I typically tend to do is I have my area of interest, which is the central one, upper left two. I then put both the upper left one and upper left three side by side. And the reason I do that is because you can see then the angulation, you can see where those teeth are sitting. And the reason I've done this specifically for this case is when I asked a, a group of students, where would you place the implant? The majority of individuals said they'd place it where that green line is placed on the, on the sectional slice. Now, understandably, that can be one of the obvious answers because it is in the place of most bone. Um, there is a whole you can dwell into the angled abutments and that aspect as well. However, if you're using PDI principles, you have to understand that your restoration will be placed in a specific way. And in this instance, it will be placed in the same area where your upper left one and upper left three are. And therefore, by proxy, your implant should be placed in the same line. So therefore, your actual green line should be much more vertical. Granted, the apex of the implant may be close to the buccal bone but you do need to do bone grafting in this, in this case. And this is a very good case to highlight the fact that you should be planning where your prosthesis is placed first, and then your implant is placed subsequent. And in this case, it should be placed in the same orientation as the adjacent teeth. And the reason for that is then the forces are transmitted on the long axis. So a very good case just to showcase that. So we then, have the implant placed in. We've taken into consideration our mesiodistal, our mesial and distal distance and our uh, biological width. Another important consideration is so always to consider that. Because of using PDI principles, we did need GBR on the buccal plate. And then I typically, if I'm using, um, if I'm doing GBR, if I'm doing any bone augmentation, we'll then place a cover screw and I'll give it about four months to osseointegrate to heal. And then we remove the cover screw, place the healing abutment for a month or so, allow the, the kind of soft tissue to really mold around there and then do the impressions. So when we do the second stage surgery, what we do is we do an envelope flap over the, over the area of the implant, remove the cover screw, place the healing abutment on there. And then we do our um, impression. So in this case, especially with the adapted workflow, did a conventional impression, so an open spaced impression, so an open space special tray. And what that means is we have a tray with essentially a window in that area. So that means it's effectively a hole in the tray over that upper left two region. You then place your impression coping into your implant. You then place your impression material. In this case, I used Impregum. The reason for that is a rigid material. You want something rigid. And the reason for that is it really holds that impression coping um, in the position that you've taken the impression and it prevents any distortion on transit. Um, we then placed our impression and as you can see it's a very good indication of the placement of the implant. So in this case absolutely bang on the money I'm happy with the placement of the implant and especially in the cingulum region exactly where we want it but you can also this is a very good indicator where you've placed your implant. So the final result it's a screw retains PFM in the upper left two as you can see, we've got the x-ray. You can see another aspect to consider is it's fully seated all the way down. Always ensure that. A common um, 
question always with 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 student groups is is um if if there's any issue with the crown but one of the things is always ensure that it's fully seated um there's no bony obstructions there's no no aspects of that you can see there's uh, correct angulation ensured it's seated really good emergence profile from the teeth good gingival contour um, and as you can see, if you've, if you've planned it correctly and use PDI principles, you will get that IDP infill, um, which you can see by the mesial and distal. You can see it's pink, it's healthy. You've got good, good, um, good healthy gums around there. So that's how you know it's a really good result. So fundamental points, use the right diagnostic tools, correct planning will allow you to have a right result. Understand your CVCT, but also your CVCT with an open system. So that, that's really crucial as well. But uh, this gives you an idea of exactly how to plan a case on a CBCT and then execute it correctly. So let's look at another case, uh, an immediate placement of an upper left four. So we've done an anterior case. We're now moving to a, a premolar region. Um, again, same sort of aspects, same principles. We take a 3D scan to visualize the area of interest. So again, more effective diagnosis, more effective treatment plan, minimize the risks look at those four areas again. So we take a CBCT scan, we look at the 3D render. So again, look at that bottom tooth, the bottom left image, you can see there's a retained root there. We then take our arch form, which is at the top left. So we go, I typically go into the middle of every tooth to an arch form. That then forms your OPG, um, where you can see any landmarks, and then you've got your sectional slice of that specific area on your bottom right. Now that's important because it allows you to see the bony aspect, but also to see the width of bone as well. So you've got to understand that part of it. And I'll highlight that with more clinical photos in a, in a second. So 3D render again, yeah, I'd say we're in the aesthetic zone. Um, with this patient, she does have a high smile. You can see this tooth in her smile line. Um, gingival recession is something to definitely consider in this aspect. And hence, it's important to understand your surgical principles. It's important to understand your flap design in this instance, for sure. Um, and also your suturing techniques as well. Um, and I'll go into that in a bit, a bit further. Um, we want a good emergence profile and a good gingival cuff as well. So there's a few considerations with this case. Whilst it may look simple from the outset, it is a bit more complex when it is something that you have a number of questions and you have to start thinking more laterally um, with, with this case. So the immediate placement, we tend to have our sectional slices. We have, I, the way, way I always do is I put my, my sectional slice in the middle, the adjacent teeth either side. In this case, you've got a good bone. It's, it's fairly straightforward in terms of where you're gonna place the crown in terms of occlusion. And then you work backwards uh, to place the implant in, into the bony area. So let's have a look at some clinical pictures. As you can see, First thing to note, yes, perio case. So step one, always stabilize the perio, um, which we've done. It took a while to do, but it's 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 point number one and stabilize perio. Second thing is ensure she's got good hygiene. So this is something, the reason I took these photos at the start is to highlight that, yep, you have to consider that aspect and you have to ensure that the patient really understands that. So really emphasize that point. So we look at an occlusal picture, you can see where the root is, you can see she's got a very good arch form, which is really, really good to consider. Um, good distance, both medial distally, good distance buccolingually or buccopilatally. And we know from our CBCT scan as well, there's good bone, bone presence underneath. Um, so you now have to start thinking laterally. So when you see this in the mouth and you see the teeth and the soft tissue, you now have to start overlaying that in your head mentally over the CT scan so you understand where to place. And the reason I say that is when you do your flap design and when you open up the gum, you'd have to start imagining where is where, where am I placing this restoration? Uh, where's the bony elements going to be? Where am I placing my implant? So you really need to understand that concept. So we have the retained root there. Then take out the retained root and we open up a flap. We, we do an H shape in this case effectively we lift back and we wanna see the buccal aspect and we wanna see the palatal aspect. And the reason you want to see that is you want to make sure there's no concavities, which we're sure there isn't from the CBCT scan, but also it gives you an idea when you're placing the implant, 
to ensure you've placed correctly, to ensure there's no perforations at the apex, and also to show if you need bone grafting present on that buckle aspect. So step one, we place our, we do our initial drill steps. We go step by step and work our way through. Place the implant all the way into bone. As you can see, you can see there's a bony defect on the buckle aspect. And that's really, really important because it does mean that we do have to do this, which is bone grafting on that buckle plate. Now, why is that important? That is important because of two things. One, we had considerations earlier off the aesthetic zone. We had considerations of the fact that she does have a high small line. We do have considerations of, we really wanna bulk that area out as well. So we, we add bone really pack it. So you really, really pack it against that buckle region. Now with the membrane side, there's different thoughts to this. You can put it just on that buckle area. I typically put it on the buckle and then bring it over nicely on, on, on the occlusal area. And then I suture over that. Um, so as you can see here, I do suture over that aspect. And the reason that's important is because I, I find you get much better healing. One thing to note here is the sutures. I use resolvable sutures in this instance. Um, but there are a number of sutures out there. I think ITI recommends a 5.0. I typically go with a three or four just because it works well in my hands. So you do have to find a suture, one that works for you, but to understand which clinical scenario you're using what in, whether you're using resolvable, non-resolvable, um, and what type of needle you're using. So I won't dwell in that too much because surgical principles were covered in a previous webinar. Um, but something to know is flap design and sutures as well. So what is the next step? What do we have to consider? So we look at our impression stage. We can either do an open or closed special spe um, spaced special tray. We have to consider impression coping and the position of the coping. We then look at our impression material. Um, Impregum is a very rigid material. Though and in some instances where you do have any undercuts, very difficult to get out. So just something to bear in mind. Another option is a PVS putty or and, and wash. If you're going digital, then it's a scan body and an intra scan. And something to consider is whether you have a Facebook record, the replica that you, whether you send it to lab or they have it, the abutment side, whether you use a TI-based manufactured or a custom abutment um, from a CAD CAM and whether you do screw retained versus cement retained crown. So if we're looking at the digital side, what is the purpose of an intro scanner? Well, the aim of an impression is to record and reproduce the form and relationship of the teeth and the oral tissues. And its purpose is to record impressions for appliances constructed outside of the mouth. So where does intro scanner fit in? Effectively, it's a digital impression. So that's effective, that's effectively what it is. So what is the benefit of an intro scanner in this instance? Its accuracy removes any problems you could have with a conventional impression, streamlines your workflow, and there is cost and time. The reason I've put this slide in there is because there are limitations on that digital side. And one of them is if you're going subgingival or and if any subgingival aspects, or if the impression is really borrowed and you can't get those areas. A very common issue here um, with scanners is and scan bodies is ensure your scan body is fully seated in the implant um i do you, you i do have instances where you may not where you may think it's seated but it isn't if you are unsure seat it all the way down take an x-ray or pa and just check it's fully seated in it's a very common thing i would do even with impression coping sometimes where you're a bit unsure just make sure it's seated and fully fully tightened down so to give you an idea of the differences I've done a comparison between conventional and digital for this case, just to highlight so it, it, it visually you can understand. Now this instance, I used a closed tray technique for the conventional. That means it has no window, but effectively we have an impression coping that is clipped into the implant. On the other side, we have a scan body that's seated all the way down uh, into the implant as well. So if we go conventional, take the impression out, I used a putty and wash. And you can see, first thing to note is the position of the implant. You can see its position exactly where we want it to be. And you can see it's good, good rigid material around the impression coping. There's no deviations. 
And it's important to understand this so that on transit, you get no discrepancies as well. If we did a digital impression, something to note here is we, the way to do this. So we take an integral scan of the arch, both arches. We then cut out that area of the implant on the scan. So you, can you see where the hole is on the upper right corner, the top picture? Put the scan body then in and then just scan that area again. And the reason for that is you get a very good soft tissue profile. So a little trick, but just that's a technique I would use. Um, you get a very good soft tissue profile and you get the scan body in that as well. So it's a few more pictures just from a different angle for, for those of you using scanners on understand the digital workflow. Um, those in stone and that, that's the top one from, from the palatal aspect as well. And then your next step is understanding what crown you're gonna use. Are you doing cement retained or screw retained? And with cement retained, it's the question here is retrievability is questionable. Passive casting, it is aesthetic for sure. It does have a cost and time element, and there is always a risk of fracture. Um, the risk of fracture is reduced with cement retained. Screw retained, however, is retrievable, does have a low profile retention. The advantage you have is there's no cement in the surface, but it does have limitations within large space. If you're asking me, the trend nowadays is to try and do screw retain. And the reason for that is it's retrievable. However, there are many clinicians, many experienced clinicians that do do cement retain and swear by it, and it works in their hands. So I would say understand both, have knowledge of both, understand when to use both. Um, I typically tend to go screw retain mainly down to retrievability. However, there may be some instances where your implant or the accident may be a bit buckled, or it may not be exactly where you want it to be, in which case cement retain may be the more viable option. Um, so it's very important to have an understanding of both and when to use them in which scenario. So what's next once we've taken the impression? We look at the shade, we look at the contacts, the emergence profile, the fit, the screw and the occlusion. So it's an Emacs upper left four, as you can see, good, good, good contour of your ginger view around, good IDP area, fully seated all the way down. So we, we, we know that this implant is, is, is in a good position purely because we've planned it correctly using PDI principles. So again, same principles, different area of the mouth, different tooth, single implant case. So let's look at the ideal workflow where you're putting everything together. So your intraoral scan, your surgical, you're planning on the, on the actual CBCT scan, surgical quiet, and the full digital workflow. So the difference between this and the adapted workflow is you take a digital impression, which is with your scanner, and that is off the teeth. You then merge that with your CBCT scan, and therefore you have the soft tissue profile on your CBCT. So what is the process? One by one, scan patient, take your CBCT scan, then use a scanner, any scanner. Um, in my instance, I use the 3600, um, and you just take the scan and then mesh the work together. And then you plan your implant on the software, plan where your crown is going to be, plan where your implant is then gonna be placed in relation to that. And then the reason I mentioned an open system at the start is because you can then export that data into any, any third party software. And the reason this is important is if you are using surgical guides, you can create a guide. Um, and I would always say with guides, they are what they say, they're a guide. So you have to understand your anatomy, you have to understand your principles. And I would use a surgical guide for maybe the initial drills, but then I'll take the guide off and then place. So think of it as a tom-tom. It, it knows how to get you there, but you still need to drive the car to get there. It's probably the best analogy I've heard. So let's look at another case. In this instance, again, an upper premolar. Uh, the opposite side. So we're looking at the upper right five. Now, same principles. Take a 3D scan, look at your 3D render, look at your arch form, go into your OPG and then onto your sectional slice. So looking at more closely, what do we need to consider? We know it's aesthetic area. In this instance, we can see there's a lot of, there's bony resorption in that area. So something to consider. We can see the roots are quite prominent. 
um, we can see the adjacent tooth does have a slightly shorter root. So there is a number of considerations just from looking at your 3D render. Look at your sectional slices. What can we see here? I always go with the adjacent teeth, um, see the root formation, see the root that you're looking to, to extract and then place the implant in. Um, look at the curvature of the root and then also that gives you an outline of the bone. We know that in this case, we will need bone grafting in that area, especially on the buccal aspect. Two reasons, one, we will need it when we're placing the implant, but secondly, it's always nice to place on the buccal aspect because it bulks out the bone and it gives you a really good emergence profile. And it also allows you to contour the soft tissue. So let's look at some clinical pictures. This is an anterior view of that case. This is the lateral view. So you can see where that, the area is missing in the upper right premolar region. So looking at the 3D render view, this is a buccal view and you can see how probably the root is. But also, can you see that concavity in the upper right five region, especially on the buccal aspect? So we know we're going to have to bring graft. We know we're going to have to bulk out a bit. Take your intraoral scan. So we've done a scan off the uh, bite, but we've also done a scan off the upper arch as well. The reason the bite is important is, is it allows us to understand where to place our prosthesis um, in relation to the implant. So then place then planning on the software. So as you can see on this software, we've got, I understand where the soft tissue is. We understand where the bony element is. We've merged them together. Then we've then placed where our crown is going to be first and then placed backwards where the implant is going to be placed. So if you look at the sectional slice element, so when you're planning on a CBCT scan, you are placing almost on every element of that scan. So you will see that implant aspect appear on every, every aspect of it. And when I mean that is you'll see it on the 3D render, you'll see it on the arch form, the um, OPG derived from the arch form and on your sectional slices. And the green outline is your soft tissue, the blue is your crown and the yellow is the implant that we're placing in there. So you, what you can do is you can rotate the crown around. And the key point with this slide is understanding where to place your crown. That is the most crucial aspect because that will then determine everything else. So what we do then, we then can export that. Do you remember saying an open system? Export it into a system where you can make a surgical guide. And this is one of those systems. This is the one I use. Um, it is small and it allows me to make a surgical guide off that area. So this is what your surgical guide will look like. Um, at the moment, it does have my name on there, but it is for a patient. Um, and the reason this is important with surgical guides is you need to understand your implant system. You need to understand if you need sleeves and those sleeves are then um, respective to different drill aspects, different drill bits. So you need to understand that, that aspect of surgical guides. But to give you an overview, you do have handles or cradles that sit over teeth. They help support the guide. And your initial, I would use a guide for the initial drills. The initial drill pieces, just to give you a marker of the angulation of where you're placing the implant. And this is all because you've planned it on the basis of where you're placing your crown. After you've done that, you then, I would take the guide off and then go conventional. That's my personal preference. Some clinicians prefer to go all the way with guides, which is fine. That's, there's no issues with that. The only thing I'd say is if you're doing that, you need to understand how to plan correctly on the software and on, on, on the guide aspect. Um, however, one thing I would say is you must open a flap. Um, I, I, I don't um, advocate flapless surgery. There is an indication for it in some instances. However, I would always say you need a flap. I'd open up and I would say you need to see the buckle and all aspect and you need to see if there's any concavities. And the reason I say that is because 90% of the cases I do, 95 will always need bone grafting to some degree. And you'll only be able to do that if you've opened a flap. So this gives you an idea of the model. Um, just so an idea of the actual surgical guide. So that is what it is on an image and on the software. And that what it is what it is on reality. So that's a printed model of the teeth. And that is the guide that goes on there. As you can see, that gives you a more, more kind of detailed view. But it, can you see how it sits on and it rests? 
and then you've got your actual um, area in the upper right region where you're placing. So step one, we open up a flap. In this case, again, I used an H flap design. You reflect back buccally and lingually. You need to see the bone. You need to see the bony ridge. You need to see the buccal aspect. You need to see the lingual aspect. Super, super crucial. Um, you need to see those areas in order to place correctly. So we go through our different drill aspects, one by one, um, placing, and then you place your implant in. As you can see, I have buried it slightly, and I would always advocate, even with a polished collar and RBM collar, um, I always go slightly subcrestal, about a millimeter. I find that works really well. You get a good profile coming out as well. So this gives you an idea, and then uh, we flap straight over and cover screw and sutured. So what's the next stages? The next stages here are conventional or digital. Now you can do conventional, open or close tray, or you can do a digital. So again, comparing the same two, conventional with a closed tray, digital with a scan body. Now, what's the difference between this? What you, I would suggest doing is I, in this instance, took a full scan. I took it with the cover screw or the heating compartment. You then cut out that area and then you take a scan again with the scan body in. So I would take both arches, scan both arches. As you can see, I have placed an implant on the bottom as well. But you then take both arches, you then take your bite. And then once you've done that, you cut out your area of interest, put your scan body on, scan your scan body. And then you can see how it is and make sure your scan body is seated. Uh, super, super crucial. If you don't, your impression, it's like a conventional impression. If your impression coping isn't seated, it is distorted. And therefore your crown won't be, will reflect that as well. So again, cement retain versus screw retain. Uh, what would you do in this instance? That's the question. Would you go cement retain? Or would you go screw retain? That's something to consider, be an interesting talking point after. Um, in this case, I had to go screw retain, but it is always a talking point. So which one would you go for? It's just something to think about as we go through the slides. Shade, contacts, emergence profile. Look at your fit. Look at whether you're doing screw retain or cement and your occlusion. Always consider your occlusion. So again, fitted down. You can see fully seated all the way down. Good profile, good gingival contour. That IDP region, you'll find this is taken straight after, but you'll find that that will infill. Um, good oral hygiene, that will infill. And the reason for that is we've placed it in the correct area. So let's look at another case. This is an immediate placement upper right one. Why is this important? I'll, I'll show you exactly why this case I've put in here. And it's there to highlight another aspect. So what have we gone to up to this point? We've understood a very simple case simple technique, no digital aspect. We've then gone through a case where we've used CVCT scan, we've used this partial digital aspect, and we've placed an upper left four, upper premolar, conventional technique for the impression. We've then looked at an immediate premolar and looked at conventional and digital. And now we're looking at an immediate anterior. Why is this important? We've done the CVCT, we've done the soft tissue or, or the intra scan, Mesh the, mesh the soft tissue with the hard tissue. Why is this important? It's important because it's there to highlight. Surgical guides are case selective. You cannot use them for every case. And there it's important to consider they're an adjunct and not a substitute to conventional implant placement. Understanding digital planning is, is definitely required. It's a very useful tool when applied appropriately. And the reason I put this in here is because this tooth, if you look in more detail, especially with sectional slices, it's a coronal fracture. It's a root fracture or coronal fracture more so. And it does need extraction. But in this case, I would not use a surgical guide. And in addition to that, you do need a flap. This cannot be done flapless. So what do we want to understand? We want to understand where we're going to place our crown. So we've got the soft tissue profile, which is the green area. We've then got where our, our crown wants to be placed, and we're then placing the implant uh, after that. So we understand where our prosthesis is, and then work backwards. Make sure your forces are transmitted on a straight line axis. Um, in this case, you would need bone grafting as well. 
So something to consider. So as you can see from your sectional slice, and you can see from your 3D. So when I was saying you can plan on the software, it shows up on every aspect of it. So definitely, definitely important. So extraction, take out the, the tooth. We'll take out the crown and, and the coronal, the, the fractured root. Open it up. You open up the flap completely, reflect back. Understand that this case needs bone grafting, especially on the buccal aspect. We've prepared this site and we've then added GBR on the buccal aspect and really reflect back that, that buccal, um, the buccal aspect so we can see the bone. And as you can see, can you see how much we reflected back all the way through, placed implant in, bone grafting, membrane straight over. Again, as I said, I placed on the buccal aspect and over, but something just to consider. And then sutured really nicely, really clean. Um, I used actually a temporary denture in this in this aspect. Um, you can use temporaries. Um, I always typically go with a denture, but as you can see, implants really nice, threaded in, good good profile um, on this case. And that's your final result. So can you see the difference? Can you see on here? This is again a talking point to consider. Well, that's abutments, which is manufacturer abutments versus. Uh, custom made abutments from, from the, the discs. Now, the reason that's important is you want to make sure your abutment is fully seated all the way down. And then you want a good emergence profile always coming up. And the reason for that is it allows um, good, good oral hygiene after, it allows good cleaning, it allows the ability to clean. And you also want to ensure there's no food trapping. Uh, a couple of other points always check with floss, check your IP contacts, since proximal contacts as well. So just something to note. So let's look at another case. So we've looked at a case where we could have used a surgical guide um, just for the initial drops. We've looked at a case where surgical guides, you've got to think about, you've got to think, are they actually suitable for that case? And then we've got a case here, which is courtesy of small, which shows a fully surgical guided case. And the reason I'll put this in here is to show you that we're doing single implant cases, but it's to show there's a multiple different options. And this is possible, but you have to choose the correct option and the correct case. And you need to understand your cases, plan them correctly, and, and then decide what you're, how you're going to undertake them. So we're looking at an upper central here. It needs it to come out. Again, straight to the software, plan it correctly. Uh, take your soft tissue scan. You then are planning your implant. Plan where your prosthesis will be, plan where your implant will be. So as you can see, there's a theme, understanding PDRP principles, understanding how to plan simple and blunt cases. So again, here, placing all the way through surgical uh, guide made up, understanding your system, understanding the sleeves that, are, that we're using, and then placing through. So you're placing all the way through. In this case, it was placed fully, fully through all the way. Um, implant was placed, temporary was placed on there. Now, one thing I would say, just so you understand with this, is temporary plans are good. I try to lower expectations. Um, sometimes your temporary can be even better than your actual crown. So just something to know. Just make sure you adjust it accordingly. Um, but really good, good crown, seated really nicely. Um, and good, again, emergence profile. You've got look the IDP. You can tell by the change of a console the color, um, as you can tell by the stiffness of it. Um, and then you've got good bone. You can see your bone is merging out. So the case with this is that you've just gonna ensure that there's good oral hygiene and the patient takes care of this implant after. So let's look at another case. This is a immediate placement of a lower right six. And the reason I've put these, the next two cases in there is they represent motor regions. So just to quickly highlight what have we gone through up to this point. We have looked at anterior cases, we've looked at pre cases, we've looked at an adapted workflow, we've looked at a digital workflow, we've looked at surgical guides and in which instance they are possible. So a number of different options for each different case. And whilst I've done this treatment plan for the different cases, there are different options or different ways of tackling them. So it's not to say one answer fits all, but what it is there to say is if you should follow the correct principles and that is prosthetically driven implant planning. 
So let's take this case for instance. We've got a lower right six, and that is a two that requires extraction. What do we need to understand? In this case, we need to understand the IDN. We need to understand where the nerve is running. We need to understand the bone. If you can see, we've taken our 3D render, we've got our arch form, we've then got our OPG derived from the arch, and then we've got our sectional slice. Now, why is that important? That is important because, can you see the concavity? Can you see how it dips in like this? That is super, super crucial and super important. In this case, it's a bit further down, so you're okay. But in some instances, it can really form an S shape, S shape and come in. And that's important because you don't want to perforate. So always crucial to have a CBCT sound. Um, and then where do we go from there? So what are there to consider here? Your lower right six axis, always an important consideration. Buckle bone resorption in this case, your IDN location, any concavities, which we highlighted in the previous slide, and your soft tissue profile as well. So let's look at our sectional slices. Now, when we go through them, I've again, same, same rule, adjacent to either side. We then look at where the nerve is running and you can see that concavity coming through. Important aspect here is understanding where your crown is going to be placed and looking at the occlusion with the adjacent tooth or the opposing tooth rather. Understanding where you want to place your crown and then placing your implant going backwards from that. So let's go through a few clinical pictures. This will help highlight. So in this case, there's a, there's a root fracture, um, so which is why the tooth was extracted. But this shows you the PA and this shows you a buckle view of that, of that molar tooth. It shows you an occlusal aspect and then shows you when it's taken out. So another important point, when you are taking out a tooth for extraction, don't take it out buckly and rip the buckle bone. Uh, you wanna preserve as much of the buckle bone as you can or as much of any bone. You wanna keep it. You want to, can you see how the roots were taken out? Really cleanly extracted out. Um, so very, very important. And the reason I show this is because you can see that thick bony, bony area in the middle very, very crucial in what we're going to use. So using, again, Norris implant here, um, use the initial drills. So we go straight in the middle. We know where our crown wants to be. We know our occlusion is going to sit. And we go step by step. It's got a pilot drill, got a 2.8 mil drill, and we just work our way up all the way through. And once we have got to our final drill, the one thing I like about this system is you place under compression. Um, that's really important. There's different ways of, of different draw sets and different ways of placing implants. And one thing I would always say is always go one draw below what you're placing. So you place under compression, because sometimes if you place the same drill as the implant, you can get it spinning in, not engaging. So I always typically go one draw down to place under compression. So we placed bang in the middle, exactly where we want to be but more so in line with where our, our tooth wants to sit and our crown wants to sit. As you can see, we've then bone grafted the entire side, placed a cover through, really packed bone, bone, bone elements in, then put a membrane, again, I put on the side, shoot straight over, and then, then stitch, then suture. And as you can see on the right, you can see the healing. You can see that little indentation, that's where the cover screw is sitting, but you can see how nicely it's healed. You can see how pink it's healed. So this is your PA of exactly where that area is. So what is the next step? Compression stage, compression material, conventional, or you can go digital. Um, so two areas where you can consider. In this case, I used a 4.3 by 11 uh, implant in this area. But the main thing to note here is where it's placed and the position. So what is our next step? Have a healing abutment. Can you see how it's exposed nicely? You can see that good good tissue around it, it's exactly what we want. And you can see when we've exposed the healing abutment, you can see where the implant is, right in the middle, dead in the center. So make sure your impression coping all the way seated down, tightened. Take your impression to so your open space putty, um, which basically what that means is I had some closed space ones before, but then open space, you cut out the middle area. So the area where the impression coping is, you drill effectively a hole in that tray, so it's a window, or you get a special tray made and sit it on that. Put your impression coping in, seat it down, mix putty, straight on. 
allow the guide pin to be seen through, unscrew the guide pin, take the impression off. So that's kind of a run through of it and take the opposing one. Your next step is then determining cement retained versus screw retained. In this case, it's an over and I would go with the screw retained. It's a molar tooth, easily retrievable, you can seat it nicely. Um, in this case, I would go screw retained. So next step is the shade, the contacts, the emergence profile, fit, screw and occlusion. So very, very important to consider these aspects. And uh, this is a case that I'm just doing at the moment, so we don't have the restorative side. Um, that is actually happening next week. Um, but the principles are, are there. So it's a simple case of got the impression down. So now it's just fitting the crown on. And the good thing with the abutments from Norris is that they are hexed. So what that means is uh, the connection is really precise and really good. Um, and I like that's an internal hex. So it sits, sinks right in. Then it's a case of just tightening. I usually tighten to about 25 to 30, depending on, on, on the tooth. And then um, cover the screw hole with PTFE tape and then cover with composite or a GSE on the top, whichever you prefer. So let's look at another case, clinical case seven. Super crucial case, really, really, really tricky case. It's a single implant case, but a very tricky case to not only manage, but to plan. And the reason is, is when we look at this case, the first thing you have to consider is access. How am I going to place an implant in that region? Uh, how am I going to get to that area? So we take our CT scan. What are important aspects here? Our important aspects are adjacent teeth. Important aspects are the maxillary sinus. Is there enough bone? What's the occlusion like this? There's a number of questions you have to start throwing in your head and thinking, how do I plan this case? So if we look at it in a bit more detail, you can see the buccal bone is resolved. You can see that eight is there. And the reason this was a tricky case is because in an ideal situation, you want to take out that wisdom tooth. That wisdom tooth doesn't need to be there. You want to take that out. You want to place nicely in the seven, get a really good, good crown there. Um, something that the patient can really, can really use or function. The only downside to this was the patient didn't want the wisdom tooth out. And as much as I would have loved to take it out, you have to respect autonomy. So we had to work within that remit. Uh, we understand the risks. We in, in, inform the patients of that aspect, but we just work within whatever, with, with, with the, within our remit. So access was the, one of the biggest things here. Buckle bone resorption, like slurry sinus, soft tissue profile and concavities. And the reason I say that is we again take the adjacent teeth there, not much bone at all, but enough to work with. Uh, but same principles, understand where a crown is being placed and then implant in line with that. So what did we do? Took the tooth out, let it heal. Step one, you can do immediate, but let it heal. Um, this is a partial OPG showing the upper right sinus and the upper right seven region, showing the eight. Ideally, the eight should go. There's no opposing tooth, it has no function, um, but patient wished to keep it. So we had to work within that remit. You can see the gap or the space between the six and eight isn't great. Um, not much space at all. Hygiene you can see is difficult for her. So emphasize really that, that aspect as well. And then understanding how to place. So open up a flap, A shape, open up the whole area, see the buckle, see the lingual, understand how we're gonna place in this area. Next step, go with your draw sequences again, again, again. Always go, I always suggest go with a draw one beneath the implant you're going to place. In this case, it wasn't 3.65, it's 4.2 as the final drill. But it's just to show you the 3.65 was one of the photos which had, which kind of showed you the angulation, showed you the position, which is why I've put it in here. And then your implant is placed, placed after that. Um, so a really good placement actually, and really good, really good area. We also then bone grafted that entire side. Um, as well, really nice. And membrane again, shooting over and sutured the site really. Leave it to heal. We left this to heal, I think that's five to six months, um, if I'm not correct, but long time we left it to heal. The reason is you want really good stability. The one thing I would say with the Norris implant is it's uh, triple threaded. So it engages really nicely. And another area, another aspect I would say with the implant, which is why I'm going back, 
is what I like about Norris and it's unique to their system is they've got the holder. Now, the reason this is crucial in this case is because it allowed me to access that point, do the initial um, engagement, and then the holder, actually the torque wrench can be placed on the holder and you place the rest of it down. This is fantastic. Really tightened it down. So another neat tip and trick, um, but very, very useful tool. So we would recommend anyone using that to, to use the holder and to actually use a torque wrench on the holder and place down. So what is the next step? Uh, conventional or digital? This instance, I use conventional. Why is this important? The important thing here is understanding where your implant is being placed. And you always want the screw hole in the correct area. You want to understand where your crown is going to be, and then you implant backwards. So that implant can be in any orientation, as long as that, that hole at the top is, is exactly where you want it to be. If, that, if, if you understand what I'm saying, it's going to be in any orientation. Make sure that access point is in the correct place and make sure your crown is, is coming out in the correct place. So again, impression. Take your impression, conventional. I used an open window putty. Really nice, mostly thick flange, really deep impression. It's a really good impression. And then understanding your cement versus screw. Um, I'd always go screw retained, always retrievable. There is an argument for cement, but in an area like this, I'd go screw retained. The other reason I would go screw retained in this area is you've got to kind of future proof. So you under, there is going to be a, a point where that wisdom tooth is going to come out. And when that does happen, we can then take off the crown and readjust the margins accordingly and get a really nice crown on there. And it's something that you have to mention to the patient at the start, inform them. Um, and if you do, they'll understand. So what's the next step? Your shade, your contacts. Um, very tricky, tricky area to restore, but durable. And uh, your fit and your occlusion. So we just fitted it this morning, actually. But as you can see, correct angulation, really nicely seated. Um, you can see all the way seated down, correct um, abutment and uh, implant interface, screwed all the way down, good bone around there. You can see it's tightened, the fins are really engaged. And um, good crown, very, very good crown. You can see the access hole. And the reason I took the second picture is to show you that once you've tightened it to about 2530, I put PTFE tape in. So that's not the final restoration. You put PTFE, PTFE tape in to really protect the access hole. And then you put composite or JSC. I typically put composite of a similar shade on top and really seat it down. That's a really nice case, but the main thing with this case is to highlight how difficult access is and the, the useful tools you have within the Norris kit that facilitate that. So what are we coming up to in conclusion? We look at our medical legal side and our risk management and what are the key themes and the key golden rules with this? And one of them is planning, prosthetically driven implant planning. That was a theme throughout the webinar and something I'm hoping you can take from this is plan where your prosthesis goes first and work backwards. Don't be afraid to bring off. Don't be afraid to open up a bit more. If you have to, you have to, but at least you've planned and placed it correctly. Um, this will then get you precision, you get good service and you'll find your, your work will last and it'll be good quality um, and you reduce your risk of litigation. And that's basically all the cases for today and, and the webinar. So if you, um, thank you for listening. Thank you for, for tuning in. And if you do have any questions, please, please, please feel free to fire in. Um, do, do pop them in, in the chat and I can go through them with you. If you want me to go through any cases um, or want me to go back through any cases, I'm happy to do so. Um, but no, thank you for taking the time to listen this evening. And I hope you've taken something from this, um, that's, uh, something from the webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah. I would like to say uh, say thank you to all of the attendants tonight. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, as Dr. Shah said, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, or you can always email me or Dr. Shah um, after or Norris Medical afterwards, and we'll answer your questions uh, straight away. Thank you so much. Uh, do, are there any questions, guys? Oh, I think there. Oh, I guess. <laughs> no questions. Amazing. Thank you so much again. Um, 
this uh, webinar will be re uh, was recorded and will be posted on our website within a week. Um, so once again, thank you very much. You can always go back to it on nursemedical.com website. Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks, guys. Good night. Thank Good you. night.